Okay, so hello everyone. Rick Albert here, real estate broker here in Los Angeles. And today as part of my community outreach, we are interviewing the amazing Emily Lewis with Living With M. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Now, for those who don't know, I recently interviewed her husband on the insurance side. So if you see the correlation, there's a reason why. So I've known Emily for close to, I think, 10 years, since the 10 years I've been down here, because I think you two were dating when I first, it is crazy. Is right? Yeah. yeah. And then Makes I remember. Makes me feel really old. <laughs> yeah, right? And then we were at a restaurant when Jimmy was working with, the, with our company, and we we're having lunch at the company luncheon, and he's like, by the way, guys, I proposed to Emily. And everyone's like, oh, congrats. But I was the guy that said, so did she say yes? <laughs> and he's like, he just looked at me like totally dumb. I was like, yeah, yes, Rick. Yes, she said yes. <laughs> I was like, okay, just wanted it's to clarify. <laughs> yeah, you can propose to people and they say no. I mean, maybe you just want to have a heart to heart. I don't know. Yeah. But, <laughs> but let's kind of just jump right into it. So uh, you work in life insurance. How did you get into it? It's not like people grow up saying, I want to get into life insurance. Right. Not quite. Right. Yeah, no, I, I wish it was that that fantasizy, <laughs> but no. No, I never wanted to be in insurance. I my now husband was in it for years prior to me getting into it and was always like, You'd be so good at insurance. And I'm like, I'm not an insurance person. It's so boring. I just couldn't get behind it. And um, you know, I had my aha moment. Um, when I had my brand new baby on my lap and my husband had kept saying life insurance. I didn't even know what life insurance was. I'm like, so you insure your life? It didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, I had this new baby on my lap and as a new parent, any new parent will tell you that you are overcome with an overwhelming feeling of inexplicable love. It just, there's, there is this innate desire to protect this person at all costs. And the, it was a perfect moment. And Jimmy showed me a YouTube commercial for a life insurance product. And uh, I had always been of the idea that life insurance is something it's sold with a scare tactic. It's fear-based. Um, sure. It's kind of slimy. And there's always like some old dude selling it, right? I yeah. saw this commercial and I had this aha moment. The commercial was promoting that you can earn points and money back depending on how much you live your life. The more you travel, the better you eat, the more you go to the doctor, the more you hike, the more you have to protect. And literally I looked down at my new infant in my arms with this crazy you know, hormone surges and desire to protect. And I'm like, where, where do I sign up? And honestly, within six weeks, I had my insurance license and the rest is really history. So I wanted to spread the word um, to all new parents. This is yeah. how you can do that. And, and that makes sense, right? It's usually major life events. You start to like start pivoting, you know, kind of adulting. Right. In yeah. some ways, like I've talked to some people and they're like, oh, I'm scared to buy a house because, you know, it's kind of like adulting. I'm like, it's just all adulting is just more expensive alcohol. Like it's just that, you know, what I mean? just, you just keep fair. going. Yeah. Uh, so let's kind of dig right into it. What, what exactly is life insurance? So that's a really great question. And it's not a dumb one because a lot of people, they just don't know. You know, yeah. people ask me all the time. I feel so stupid asking, but what is life insurance? So life insurance is an insurance policy that you purchase so that in the event you die, your beneficiaries will get a lump sum of tax-free cash. Um, and so it literally is protecting your income, your assets, um, anybody that is depending on you for life insurance is who should have life insurance. So effectively, it's not even really insurance on yourself, it's insurance for the life of others. It's, that's perfectly stated. So, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard the adage, but when, when you attend or don't attend a funeral, you're not doing that for the person who died. The funeral is for the living, right? Sure. And makes that's sense. just like a life insurance policy. A life insurance policy is for who you leave behind. Mm -hmm. um, and so I could go down, like get up on my soapbox and start saying all the <laughs> things, but I'll wait for your questions. Oh, okay. Thank you. So um, I do know 
that there's different types of life insurance policies. So what are on a, I know you can get really granular on, on all of them, but what is on an overview, what are some of the different policies and how does someone kind of figure out what one works for them? Yeah, so the two, yes, you're right. We can get really granular, granular. it can get very convoluted, but just a broad overview, the two main types of life insurance are gonna be your term insurance and your permanent insurance. Permanent is often called whole life. You'll probably, mm -hmm. You've probably heard that before, yeah. but it's technically permanent. So term insurance is really your temporary insurance. This is your most cost-effective type of insurance, biggest thing for your buck. You can get it up to a term as long as 30 years. Some people go for 10. I really don't encourage that. We can get more into that, more into why later. Mm -hmm. um, but really when people are purchasing term, they're doing it when they're young and when they're healthy, when their kids are young, if they're anticipating ever buying a home, um, anything like that to cover large assets. Um, and the idea is that when we're young, our debts are high, our bills are high, and being that term insurance is the best bang for your buck, you add this monthly, you know, bill on, so to speak, and God forbid the unthinkable happens, you've got this large sum of cash to cover your loss, um, the loss of your income, the loss of your support, um, and so on. On the flip side, you've got your permanent or your whole life insurance. This also can be used as a death benefit should worst case scenario happen, but these are more permanent. So these are really designed um, around a couple of ideas. One is to, you know, so somebody like yourself, Rick, somebody in their 30s, a 30 year policy at most is gonna last until they're in their 60s, right? Well, we're planning to live a lot longer than that. And if your goal is I wanna make sure that my beneficiaries get money regardless of how old I am when I die. We wanna talk about a permanent policy, okay? Mm -hmm. Because the younger and healthier you are when you buy it, the less expensive that annual premium is gonna be. So the permanent can cover a big picture, long-term kind of investment. But the other thing that a permanent policy can do is it can be a tool in your portfolio to build wealth and grow cash. Um, how, uh, how does it build wealth or build cash? Is it just because you just get the lump sum at the end and? No, so there's, so uh, you can always stop me if I get too down the rabbit uh. hole, but when you're talking about a permanent policy, there's a few different types. And the biggest one that I sell, certainly right now I say it's trending amongst my under 30 crowd. Um, that's really a great, I, I've got people of all ages, I've got people close to retirement, post-retirement purchasing these policies actually. But if you can get in under 30 to get a cash product, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at a monthly premium or, or the monthly owed toward an insurance bill, okay, your money when you're looking at a permanent policy is effectively going into three buckets. It's going to pay for the cost of insurance, that cost is determined on your overall health and your age, bucket number one. Bucket number two, it's going to cover, you know, the administrative fees that keep the lights on at the insurance company. There's no doing away with that one. And then bucket number three, whatever's left over from that total investment is actually going in to the policy. And as the market ebbs and flows, like the S&P 500, for instance, as that comes and goes up and down, that is, your cash will grow. And so you can use the accrued cash in a number of ways. Number one, you can take the accrued cash. So I just did an illustration for somebody this morning. She is 27. And by the time she is 65, she has a potential cash accrual of $234,000. Very nice. Which is pretty remarkable. I mean, my father's 70. He acts like he's 40 or 50. He's still out and about right. what he wouldn't do for you know, 200,000, 300,000 in cash right now. It would mean everything. So you can either A, take that money, borrow it as you see fit. You pay a nominal interest rate. You're effectively paying yourself back. So it's anywhere from one to three points to borrow that. You mm -hmm. can surrender it completely and cancel the policy, cancel the death benefit, take that cash and reinvest it entirely, party mm -hmm. with your spouse before you know, end of life, whatever. You can yeah. do many, many things. I just had a client, I mean, I'm, I'm five years into my business. Um, so, you know, I'm on the younger side of 
of this, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have a lot of clients who are who had these accumulate for a number of decades and they're pulling. Sure. But I did just have my first client. She had the policy for just about five years and she was able to come in, borrow about 10 grand and do some life plan planning with it. So it's nice. actually going to help her put it down toward a house um, and it's help with some medical expenses. And it's a, it's a really special tool. Oh, that's awesome. That's amazing. And yeah. I would imagine that once you've locked in a price, that's the price for the 30 years, 20 years. It doesn't change. It doesn't go down. It doesn't go up. It's just, this is what you've locked in. Yeah. So first of all, that's a hard guess with a term policy. So right. when you are underwritten on a term, whatever you're in, regardless of what happens, that is the rate you're locked in. As long as you pay that premium, you are good. When right. it comes to permanent policy, typically speaking, I build those out so that the premium can be flexible so that sometimes people want to overfund them to pay mm -hmm. it off quicker so that that uh, interest can accrue faster. Um, so that can yeah. ebb and flow a little bit. Um, I had a person whose policy I replaced recently. Um, he was with another company and he hadn't paid in like two years. Mm -hmm. Why did that policy or I should say, how did that policy keep remain in force well it just started eating the cash value so instead of paying his bills he just started eating into his cash value i don't advise that but if push comes to shove you could, that's certainly enough so it keeps your policy going keeps the policy going keeps the death benefit there so if a mm -hmm. catastrophe happened his family still had the i think it was a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar death benefit he did eat the cash value so when we ultimately surrendered the old old policy we took the money out and reinvested it into a new. He only had about 8,000 left, but still it was sure. 8,000. Right, that he didn't have before. That he didn't have before. And he also was able to maintain a life insurance policy for two years without having to pay the premium that he initially was signed Got up for. Got it. Yeah. So then typically this, um, full disclosure, this actually isn't on the list of questions, but it made me think about it. So yeah, if I have a pol if I'm a policy holder and my beneficiary is my, my wife, uh, who's just on the other side over here and Hello. yeah, <laughs> what is the process for her? God forbid something were to happen to me. Sorry. Ask me that one more time. If the benefit, I got excited that she was right there. Oh. So I to <laughs> uh, what, what's uh, basically what's the role of the beneficiary in terms of how do they collect? Oh, that's a really great question. So your beneficiary should always be aware that they are your beneficiary, right? That's, that's, a, that's a good, what's that? It's part of the surprise. It's part of the fun. <laughs> I mean, I do always like secretly hope that somebody put me as their beneficiary and somebody's right? going to call me up and be like, you have yeah. 500,000 coming at you, lady. <laughs> that would I, be pretty awesome. I've actually heard um, people are saying, hey, for like weddings, hey, send an invitation to like, the Oprah's of the world, Bill Gates, all them, because they're so busy, they probably won't even pay attention. Like, well, I'm not going to go, but go ahead and send them a gift. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? Right? I was so tempted to try, but I was like, eh, just in case they show up, I got to make sure we have enough tables. I, <laughs> we have to have the Obama Oprah table. Right, over exactly. Here. I don't know. Basically, where I'd be. <laughs> Bye. Yeah, right. Um, but okay, so. The beneficiary, they should know, makes sense. And then they just contact the insurance company and just saying, yeah, here's a death certificate. Yeah. And in most cases, that insurance company is going to have the contact information of the beneficiary. There was a time where across the board, the beneficiary's social phone number address and all of that was required. These days, it depends on the carrier, but I may have as little information as just their name because mm -hmm. it's pretty easy to track somebody down. I mean, it's, it's pretty sure. hard to hide these days, right? Um, but in most instances, when a death occurs, um, the A, the beneficiary is familiar that they are on the policy. Uh, B, if not, we know how to find them. But what's really neat is when somebody dies, there's all sorts of people around. There's the attorneys and there's the, you know, the funeral home and all of this stuff. And everybody wants their money, right? The life insurance agent actually gets to show up with the money and mm. it's tax free, which is extra special. I mean, I'm not saying I'm any hero by any means, but in a very challenging time in life, you know, typically when you've lost somebody, it's right. nice to know that there is a little bit of light and you can, you know, I always tell people, especially my older crowd, you want to be able to grieve 
you don't want to have to grieve and wonder how you're going to pay for XYZ. Especially if it was sudden, right? If it's unexpected. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, yeah. I hear that happen with people and it's just like, it's just, it's hard to process because you weren't emotionally ready for it. Yes, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I don't know about you, but I see these GoFundMe campaigns all oh, yeah. the time. And the most devastating ones are the sudden ones, right? He went out drinking Saturday night. I never saw him again. Um, you know, we hear about car accidents. We hear about freak falls, things that have things happen. Right. They happen. Um, and those are the most devastating because it's a surprise. We, everybody thinks I'll do it later. I'll do it later, right? There's nothing tangible here. You don't get to buy an insurance policy and get a beautiful new house right. or a new car. You get a, oh, cool, I'm protected. But really the truth is you get your, uh, I was gonna say your P's and Q's in a line. You've got your ducks in a row. There you go. <laughs> Things are taken care of and so. Yes, it's very, very important. And it's not even really that expensive if you do it young enough. Right, you know what? You're so right. It is stupid and expensive. It is. People are so, uh, me, people are misguided. People mm -hmm. think it's really expensive. Number one, it can be. Sure. If you want it to be, we can make it expensive, right? It doesn't have to be. So for example, and this is always on a case by case basis. Of course. But I will tell you a 40 year old woman who is in good health, not even perfect health, can get about 500,000 in coverage for less than $20 a month. Yeah. Like, I think, yeah, I think with us, when you signed us up, you know, we're looking at the monthly and then we looked at the yearly. I'm like, why don't we just pay the year off? Like yeah. we have the money, especially during yeah. COVID, right? Everyone's saving tons of money through COVID right. <laughs> yeah. for, not going, for not going out. It's like, let's just pay the year off and then just not worry about it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting that you say that because mo like historically everybody wants to pay monthly. It's a set it and forget it. But in COVID, people follow that same line of thought, right? Like I haven't gone out in months. I don't spend money like I used to. Yeah. Might as well fork over the five hundred or a thousand or whatever it is and just yeah. handle it, not have to worry about it. Yeah, exactly. No, that makes yeah. sense. So kind of going into COVID, and this is probably more from a business perspective, but how has that changed things for you? Has your business picked up because people are more concerned is kind of my yeah. assumption. <laughs> yeah, it's a loaded question. Um, yeah. so, so the short answer is, yeah, it's crazy. I um, you know, I did not know when COVID started. All of my business comes from me meeting people, being out in the field. Um, you know, I'm fortunate that I get to work while I'm at lunch or, you know, playing with kids in the park, you know, just really getting to know people. When COVID happened, all of that was taken away. Um, so I didn't know how that was going to pan out, but business has been very fruitful for That's life great. insurance agents uh, like myself, because I think that mortality really became, it was in our face, right? Yeah. And it, freak, it freaks people out. Um, so that's one way that it's affected the business. It has, you know, life insurance sales have skyrocketed. Like I say, I think people are recognizing that life is fragile. Anything can happen. Um, I mean, even look at our leadership right now, right? right. Like even it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how much money you have or how healthy or unhealthy you are. Anybody can go at any time. And we just have to be in, I'll tell you what, Rick, I run into people of all ages, all phases and stages of life. And there's just, you know, it's like one out of five people, they absolutely hate to talk about death. Makes oh, yeah. them really uncomfortable, makes them really uneasy. They don't even, they can't even say the word. Yeah. I get it. I used to be the same way, but I think like being in this business, like I, I obviously had to get over that, but it's like, you gotta just do it. You gotta rip the bandaid off, right? You gotta talk about it, handle it, and then we never have to talk about it again. Right. It's blood. Um, the other way that COVID has affected my business is one of the main steps to accruing uh, life insurance is doing a medical exam. And so that's an expense on the insurance company. And a medic, you know, an examiner, it's either a nurse or a phlebotomist will come into 
really wherever it's most convenient for you, most people choose their home, um, to do a blood draw, um, ask a handful of questions, et cetera. And nobody wants a stranger in their home, especially a medical professional. Right. Um, so that has caused some delays that, and that's all up to the client. You know, we're, I am like the utmost patient person um, when it comes to that. My kid's different story, but when it comes sure. to clients, very patient. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they will say, like, I have a lady right now. We started this pre-COVID mm -hmm. and she's just got scheduled to do her med next week because she's been uncomfortable. She had a baby. She didn't want mm. it and it was understandable. And we put it on For her. Sure. Now, the neat thing is, is I have a tool that actually allows my clients, if they are, um, like you guys would have been a perfect candidate for this. Um, I just didn't have it at the time, but they, if, depending on age and health, they can bypass the medical exam. Mm -hmm. So that has allowed a lot of people to get their insurance quickly and easily. Um, but that's certainly an added factor, right? Thinking sure. about somebody coming into your house. And, I mean, and not everyone is required to do the medical exam, even in, even beforehand. Yes, that is true. That so is how, true. So, so how do you determine who has to get the physical, who doesn't? Yeah, so usually it starts with me just kind of doing some field research with you. You know, if you are really the uh, criteria is 50 and under some companies is 55 and under but the older you get the more of a history you have naturally speaking sure. so when somebody is young is on very few prescriptions there's a couple of prescriptions that just knock it into they need a medical history but for the most part little to no prescription medication and you know, under 50 is going to get you into candidacy of okay. being able to bypass that med. And I'll always disclose that to the client. Look, you this may happen for you and it's great. Um, I had a, I once had a couple actually, they were disappointed that they qualified for non-med. They were really looking forward to getting their med exams. Oh wow. And I was like, Sorry. I mean, I guess it's a plus because if you do that, you know, the med exam is no cost to you and you don't even have to commit to the insurance if you choose not to. Um, I have had a few people learn. I had one person learn they were pre-diabetic through that med exam and another person learned that they had extremely high cholesterol through that med exam. So um, it can be a beneficial thing, but they were so healthy that they didn't need it. Um, right. So that was kind of funny that they were disappointed. But um, yes. So if you, if I think you're a candidate uh, to bypass the med and then I end up being wrong and you had to get it, that's a luck of the draw thing. Okay. So sometimes these companies, it's just kind of the number that they pull. You have to do the medical exam and that's the end of the story. But and typically, and correct me if I'm wrong, like anyone can get life insurance. It just depends on how much. So how do you determine like how much coverage they need? Yeah, almost everybody. I mean, you know, the um, the always and nevers are something I have to be really careful of, sure, right? Of because course. there's all, there's a rule to all of this, a rule breaker, I should say. Um, and it does. It really depends on your budget. So what we tip, this is a little bit veering off of what you asked, but mm -hmm. usually I will tell somebody to apply for the highest that you're considering and the longest. So if you're like, oh, I don't know if I should get a million or two million, and I don't know if I should do 20 or 30, I go, okay, I mean, we talk much more than that, but really right. just a quick example. I say, go for the 2 million 30 year. Let's see how the offer comes back. If the offer comes back favorable, we know it'll be, you know, a hundred dollars a month, let's just say, right? Yeah. If it comes back unfavorable and it's 200 a month, we just cut it in half, right? You do not have to commit to anything. It's a lot easier for the insurance company to come down in the offer, mm -hmm. right? If we already got approved for 2 million 30 year, it's a lot easier to be like, I'll take a million 30 or a million 20 than it is to get approved for a million and bump that up. Now we're like, well, why are we bumping that up? Right. No, that, that makes, makes sense. sense. Yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, so that's just to say, if we've got some medical concerns or we're not sure how this is really going to pan out, although I do try my darndest to make sure I'm accurate with all of the above, um, in the quote process, 
we can always adjust it before you sign on that dotted line. Um, how do we determine how much coverage an individual needs, I think was your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, there's a quick way and there is a not so quick way. The quick way is, and I'll tell you about nine out of 10 people choose the quick way because we ain't got no time for that. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, we do stuff. I recommend, I usually recommend 10 times your annual income, seven and a half to 10 times is like the, the nice little sweet spot. Reason being, if something were to happen to you, your dependents could rely on that income for the next seven to 10 years, plus the cost of funeral and burial expenses without ever having to worry about a thing. That's and arguably it's tax-free. So it actually goes even further, right? Because yes, if someone makes $100,000 a, really a year, they're not taking home $100,000 a year. That's very true. Yes, really good point. And um, why is it tax-free? You haven't asked that, but I want to touch on it because people yeah. ask it all the time. It's tax-free because you're paying with it for post-tax dollars. You're right. You're paying mm -hmm. for it with an income. Um, so you're not, there is no like fine print there. You get this check and there is so you're no, not taxed like, twice. you're not taxed twice. Um, yeah, and then the complicated way, um, and you know, sometimes I've got some real savvy numbers people and they like to do this and I understand it. It offers some control and it allows you to kind of take your, your finances into your own hands. Um, there's a worksheet that we'll go through and it talks about, you know, uh, we put in like income inflation protection and we put in children's education and mortgage and all of these things and it, it eventually will spit out a number pretty close to what we just discussed. Right. But it just kind of breaks everything down to see all right, how much do you actually need? Yes. Yes. And it, it definitely offers the, that type of consumer a little bit more peace of mind that they're getting enough. So what I find, Rick, is that when somebody is not satisfied with my seven and a half to 10 times answer, mm -hmm. it's because they're worried that they're not going to have enough. And so if we take it line item by line item and we consider orthodontia and we consider education and we consider, are you going to be in private school until you're in college? Are you going to be living in Los Angeles or Virginia? Right? Like all of right. these things. And then that just offers that person that much more peace of mind knowing that they did everything they can. Um, and I do want to add to this, um, you know, especially when you're younger, you don't know how much you're going to be making in 10 years. Like things change. Right. And, and you can't necessarily come into your life insurance policy and say, increase it 50%. It doesn't work like that. However, life insurance is different than any other kind of insurance like car or homeowners. Those types of insurances, you can only get what the replacement value would be as mm -hmm. protection. When it comes to life insurance, you can actually build and tack on life insurance as you see fit. So many Many people have multiple policies. So as life circumstances change, you may choose to entirely replace your old policy, or you may say, you know what? I've got the million for such a low cost for the next 15 years. I think I'm gonna add on another million and I'll have 2 million for the next 15. When that original drops off, I still have this million. So just to say, regardless whether it's term or permanent, a cash product or not, you can always add and stack, which is really uh, nice. Out of curiosity, um, so let's say you get a million dollar policy and you're paying a thousand bucks a year for 20 years. So you, you're into it for 20 grand. Is How do the insurance companies make money? Are they just banking that you live that, that whole time? I know it's kind of like <laughs> behind the scenes, but it's just like conceptually, it's like, what if there was like a COVID happens and it's like, now they got to pay out yeah. all these policies. Yeah, so, you know, that's a really interesting question, yeah. just keeping COVID on the mind. Sure. Uh, COVID aside, uh, you know, this is all statistic-based, statistic right? Sure. And so this is why, you know, this underwriting is done. Um, one thing to keep in mind if you're considering purchasing life insurance or changing life insurance or what have you, these prices are never, ever set by your agent. And I know we're going to talk about agents and choosing a yeah. great agent later on, but Prices are never set by an agent. Um, an agent like myself, I don't choose any kind of, uh, charge any kind of consulting fee or anything. I literally don't charge anything. I just get paid by the insurance companies. Sure. Um, 
And so bring me back. Where was I? It was Liz May. Oh, just about like how like insurance companies make their money and how do they make their money? So it's statistically based, right? And so when we do this underwriting, oh, that's what I was saying. Sorry. <laughs> Just no like worries. zoned out for a minute. Um, so, so we, so I don't set the prices as the agent, right? The insurance company, and actually their underwriters set these mm -hmm. prices, right? So what I do is I come in and I ask you all these questions up at the front. What's your height and weight? Are you on any prescription medication? Are you a smoker of any kind, nicotine, uh, tobacco, marijuana? How frequently? What kind of, you know, lifestyle habits do you have? Then that gives me enough information to kind of, give a pretty educated guess like I, I play a game with myself i like to be really accurate <laughs> right but then what happens from there is the underwriters come in and they've got books bigger than the sky that have every condition and every statistic in there and it says look if you're a 30 year old male with no you know health implications you're on no medication the chances of this person dying in the next 30 years are yay high, right? They're really low. On the contrary, you got a twin brother that matches that, you know, birthday, same age, but he's a smoker and he's obese and he is on two antidepressants and an anxiety medication. In contrast to the first guy we just talked about, this guy is, he's, a, he's got more of a risk. Sure. And so all of these prices are based off of the risk. So that's really, you know, when they, yes, they can be very low cost in life insurance, but if you're a riskier individual, they, you got to pay for it. Now, does your policy change? Let's say, um, I quit smoking, for example. So would that change anything? in terms of how much yeah. you're paying per year? Like if I get a policy as a smoker and then Correct. I quit. Yeah, it's a really good question. So- This might encourage people to you know quit smoking, start working out. It does. In fact, I mentioned a little while ago, it's so weird. I don't know what it is, but I, when I work with clients, everything trends and it's fascinating mm -hmm. to me. So right now I've got this under 30 crowd trending on cash products. Um, and I also just recently finished a trend of middle-aged guys who smoke, who want life insurance with a plan to quit smoking. It's just so strange, like mm. how this happens. So every person who smokes has a plan to quit. I almost always, I'm like, they're, oh, I'm planning mm. to quit. They think I judge them and I don't. <laughs> so there's a couple of ways to answer this question. Number one, if you come to me and you say, Emily, I want life insurance but I smoke, what do I do? Okay, we get you a life, but you're the person who needs it more than anybody, number one, right. you smoke. That's okay, there's no shame in, my, in your game. Smoke, be free, live your life, but right. you're gonna pay for the policy, right? If you come in, let's say your policy has been in effect for five years, in force, I should say, and for five years, and you go, I quit smoking the first year I got it. Perfect, we're gonna rewrite you. Got We're going to go right back through underwriting. You're now a non-smoker. Um, you've been a non-smoker for four years. It's usually 24 months is the norm. That, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. Yep. It's like, I can smoke, yep. quit smoking tomorrow and be like, yeah. all right, here no, we go. It's usually 24 months. I think there is a couple companies that will accept 12 months. Um, yeah. But yeah, we just, that's it. We want to, we would rewrite you. We wouldn't cancel the original policy till the next policy was placed in force. The other thing that you can do, if you come to me and you go, I want life insurance, I'm a smoker, but I'm going to quit. Mm -hmm. There is actually an amazing smoking cessation program offered through John Hancock, mm -hmm. and it is a total incentive to quit. So they will let you come in for the first 36 months as a non-smoker. They will give you three years to quit. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah. And then... At the end of that 36 months, you will have to, I think you have to go through a series of questions and like um, like a blood test. Sure. It's sort of, um, it's not 100% uh, impromptu, like you kind of know when it's gonna happen, but they don't give you like weeks notice, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you can tell if somebody's quit smoking or not, um, but they give you three, 36 months. And if you have quit, they keep that a non-smoker rate. And if you haven't, they just increase it to a smoker rate. Oh, nice. So, so I mean, have, they like back charge you. 
they don't. Yeah. They don't back charge you. There's no penalty. It's just, you know, I have um, one gentleman in underwriting right now and his wife is just tickled. You know, she's so excited that he's, you know, this is totally, and I actually have many clients who are in this program and, you know, I joked with them at the beginning, Hey, do you want me to never thinking anybody would take, take me up on it, but do you want me to check in on you? Like, are yeah. you, do you want me? And I, and I do. Buddy. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's what I call it too, an accountability buddy. Um, and I am their accountability buddy and I check in quarterly or twice a year and I just say, how's it going? Yeah. And some people are like, I'm doing good. I'm six months in or whatever the case may be. And some are like, I'm trying and it's okay, you know, yeah. but it's nice that it puts that in their mind. For sure. For sure. And that makes sense. So let's say, can you actually cash out on your life insurance early? Let's say, um, I try not to be insensitive. Like, let's say I become like a vegetable, right? Like it's just, I need, but so therefore I can't work. I can't bring in money for the family, but right. I have these hospital bills. Like, can you cash out on these policies early? Yeah. Really, really good question. So on a term policy, no, most, most often, no. Uh, term is very basic, very black and white. You either, you know, die and get the money or you survive and you don't. Mm -hmm. On a permanent policy, there's a lot more opportunity to add bells and whistles, so to speak. Um, and there's writers, they're called writers that you can build into these policies. So there's like a critical illness writer where this would probably fit in. Um, there's a chronic illness writer uh, where you've got maybe not a vegetable, but maybe you do have some sort of condition that's not allowing you, uh, you've got, you've got a, let's say, um, where you have to get, um, kidney, what's the thing called? Dialysis. Dialysis. Yeah. Twice a week, right? And it's really impacting your life. You know, uh, kidney failure is what it would be. Mm -hmm. um, that may be an instance where, like, don't quote me on the actual condition, but that's just sure. an example of a, you know, a writer built in where you can cash out on a certain percentage of the policy. Um, and then the third most common is a long-term care writer. So right. long-term care is a whole other animal. We will not get into that today, um, but it is a type of in a policy, a type of insurance that I work quite a bit with. And it can also be a writer built onto these policies. So in long-term care, there's something called ADLs. These are activities of daily living. There are six of them. They include walking, feeding, bathing, consonants. I always have them written down, kidding, <laughs> dressed, and transferring. And if you lose two of those permanently, you would qualify for your long-term care writer. So that was a long answer, but the short answer is there is a way to, um, it, you have to have some forethought about that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess you probably take a look at, you know, what's happening in your medical history, even like with family, yep. like if your family's had certain conditions. Yep. Hit the nut, hit it on the nose. That's exactly right. It's like, okay, then maybe I, that might happen. Yes. That's a perfect example. So, um, you know, I have a lady who she was just terrified she was going to get cancer. Um, I think it's probably stands to reason it's, yeah. you know, a leading cause of death in the nation. Um, and she's a very high earner. She's a single mom. She has two kids who depend on her. Her fiance had just passed away and she mm. was like, give me all the bells and whistles. I want it all because right. as a high earner, she has a high expense, right? She's got lots of expenses and she's like, I don't want my kids' lives to be demoted if I am bedridden, right? Right, And they, they won't be. She will continue to be able to, to get the money that she needs. Nice. Yeah, I would imagine, you know, especially in areas like Los Angeles, where it is more expensive, just in general, right? Totally, Housing right. costs, like it's almost like it's, it's more necessary here than it might be in other areas. Yeah, I mean, I think it, I would think it m less depends on where you live and more depends on your income. So for yeah. instance, if you are making 50,000 a year, but you are surviving off of that, which here would be almost impossible if yeah. you were, uh, especially if you were solo, um, you know, would I say go get that rider and build it in? Probably not because the income, it would be hard to reason that with the income. Not mm -hmm. that the writer is super expensive, but the policy that you would have to make that pay out, would it just wouldn't financially make sense. 
On the flip side, if you were making six figures, multiple six figures, that would be something that we would absolutely want to talk about. Right. And that makes Especially sense. Especially if I might add, there is no other income, right? Like if you are the sole income, your job, you don't have rental properties or other modes of money coming in. It is just your job. Yeah. yeah. That's something you'd want to think about. For sure. No, I'd imagine you bring up a good point, like single parents, things like that. It's like, yeah. this is all my kids have. Yeah. And God forbid something were to happen because there's buses, there's whatever. So you yeah. gotta make sure they're covered. Yeah. You know, not everybody has parents living right here that can. Right help and take over and and this individual was totally um alone and wanted to make sure that again her ducks were in a row and if smart you know she's very very savvy it's the most you know the people who build those writers in um those are your real savvy financial people um usually it is a high earner because there is a correlation between you know high earners, having, um, you know, your affairs sorted out. Um, certainly, you know, it's sometimes it can be a pull to get people um, to get the just basic life insurance because they just don't see the need for it. If they're, if they don't make a big income, they're like, well, they're not going to be missing much, but it's like, they right. don't understand if that's completely gone. Yeah. You know, something is better than nothing is what oh, I always sure. say. Yeah, I know when um, when my wife and I were talking about it with you, you were kind of factoring, he's like, okay, well, we have these mortgages. They're fairly young as far as mortgages are concerned, right? It's like sure. kind of in the beginning stages for yeah. some of them. So it's like, well, God forbid something were to happen tomorrow. These are big balances. Yeah. So if we had to, it's like, okay, use the money. You could pay off one of them. The other one's a rental. So it's like, fine, they're, they're self-sufficient in that respect. But to yeah. your point, or they might want to reinvest the money, do whatever. Yeah, and that's the thing too, Rick, is that you never want to be pigeonholed into making a decision. Mm -hmm. You want to have options. I could go A and I could go B. And that's really nice for you guys because you do have the options there. Right. Right. And you can choose to reinvest it or live off of it, whether that's the, the life insurance benefit or a rental income or what have you. Sure. Um, you know, for the people you know, just to touch back on single parents, like I have done a lot of speaking engagements where I talk to single parents because these are the people that are just trying to survive. I mean, we all are, but especially a right. single parent, they're just trying to get to nighttime. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, right? It's you day know, by like day. Bedtime, exactly. And so these kinds of things are not at the forefront of their mind, but they would be if they needed it. And so I want to make this a topic of awareness, like, look, we can make it fast, we can make it inexpensive, and we can make it really easy just for some peace of mind, because we don't want to do a GoFundMe. <laughs> right. And have to start asking friends and things like that. And also, I would imagine it kind of forces you to constantly relive it. I would imagine that yeah. too. Yeah, I mean, fortunately, I, mean, I haven't been in that situation, fortunately, but like, I would imagine it's like, you're constantly asking people, hey, I need money. Why, why do you need money? Because so-and-so passed away. And you have that yes. conversation over and over and over again. Yes, yes. I could only imagine. I have this wonderful story that I love to share um, and I'll keep it really short. But so two friends started a business together um, they're in their fifties now. They've been in best friends since they were kids, uh, to the point where it reminds me of somebody else I know. Um, but to the point where one, they both called one of the guys, mom's mom, like mm -hmm. both of their moms were each other's mom, right? They've known each other forever. So mom, mom is old, right? Mom's in her mid eighties. She gets the flu. She gets sick. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the, the friend, not her son, goes to check on mom on his lunch break. Mom passed away peacefully. So he's got to call his friend up and he's got to say, hey, mom passed away today. Mom thought of everything. Mom had her little grandma coin purse and, and actually it was like a little, uh, like perfectly square little wallet with one of those little, I don't know what you call them, where you like click it open. Oh yeah, you know yeah. I, I <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yes, so in there she had a business card size P 
piece of paper and on that business card, she had her attorney, her life insurance agent and her, I think the funeral home, because she wanted to be buried next to dad, mm -hmm. uh, numbers written down, everything was sorted out. All of her affairs were in order. Yeah. So as sad as this was, as rather sudden as it was, she had everything ready to go. So sons, grandchildren, daughters, everybody could focus on grieving and remembering her and the money, everything was just handled. Everything was wrapped up almost with a perfect little red bow. So right. that's just an example. I mean, just look at any GoFundMe story for the other example, right? right. The other end of the spectrum. But that, what I just shared, is the ideal way to leave your loved ones. For sure. No, that makes sense. So let's kind of do, um, I came up with a couple of different scenarios. Kind yes. of like what if. Uh, so let's kind of go through them. We'll call it lightning round. So let's start with the first one. Beneficiary kills the policyholder. What happens? I'm he saying that a bit louder in case she's listening. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> she flips me off. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. Um, so the beneficiary kills the policy owner. Is the beneficiary going to get the money? Yes. Not unless they're really good at what they do. Sweet. Yeah. It's, it's uh, you know, I wish, honestly, I wish I had a dollar every time I heard this joke. Not, not this, this is not yeah. a joke, but I mean, yeah. the, uh, the joke. The scenario. That the, yes, yeah. I get it almost every time I sell a policy to a family. They're like, oh, good, I can push her down the stairs now. Yeah. You know? I have a million reasons why. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so, you know, if there's foul play suggested, uh, that would absolutely be put on hold until the court case was completed. Got it. And then it would just go to the next person in line or whoever else is on the policy. Yeah. So you bring up a great thing. So when you are getting your life insurance, you have to put a beneficiary down, but you don't have to put a contingent beneficiary down. So mm. a contingent is who gets the money in the event that both you and the primary beneficiary pass at the same time. It's not required. It's highly recommended. Sure. If there's no contingent there, there's nowhere for the money to go right. and it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. So if anyone's watching this, just put me down. Yeah. Or me. Yeah. No, there I don't you know go. if you can. I don't could, think that's allowed. <laughs> yeah. Put uh, Rick down. Okay. Put, put it with me. No. Absolutely. <laughs> this this could be a really good business plan. We can make Ooh. this work. <laughs> um, okay. So what if the beneficiary goes to jail? Does, does jail time affect even if it was not related to the policyholder, does that make any difference? Mm -mm. No. no, that, I mean, I, there may be some sort of, but no, the beneficiary's lifestyle has nothing to do with the benefit. Mm -hmm. um, so, and a different example, but an example nonetheless of this would be children. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times people will put their children down. You know, my kid's 12, is that allowed? Mm -hmm. um, Certainly, there will be some pushback when it comes to, um, hold on, I'm so sorry, um, when it comes to that child actually receiving the money because it's going to come down to who is their caretaker, but you can really, you can really put anybody down as your beneficiary and so long as they are an adult of age, um, they would get that money. That's it. I didn't think Well, actually, that. that's not true, but sorry, finish your thought and then I'll correct well, myself okay so yeah you're right if the beneficiary is supposed to go to the kids but if the kid's under 18 does that have to go and take a living trust and then it's whoever manages the trust would that be the loop around to make sure that the kids actually get the money yeah really good question so this yes you should have a living trust ideally we would all have life insurance a will and a living trust right it's like pulling teeth to get one of those three things Right. If you don't have a living trust and the money goes to a child, the idea or the hope is that, that there's some sort of plan, whether unofficial or not, uh, official or not official, that is, uh, with who, whom the guardian would be for that child. And it would be expected that that guardian is somebody that you trust and that's who would manage that money, right? Got it. Um, now, I just said anybody could get the money. Mm -hmm. That is not true. When you put a beneficiary down and you say, Harry, the postman, mm -hmm. we're going to want to know why Harry, the postman, 
And if you tell me, well, he's just a nice guy and I just feel like he could really use the money, mm -hmm. most insurance companies are not going to feel comfortable doing that because we don't really know who Harry is and how he's connected to you. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a time in my career where I thought, oh yeah, just any Tom Dick or Stanley can come on and be your beneficiary. Cause I didn't really, nobody ever really told me differently. Sure. But the truth is, is that person needs to have some sort of connection to you. Um, it can be like really any family member, you know, uh, like one of our contingents is a very dear friend. She's not a family member, but she's very intricate part of our lives. Right. So we can stand to reason why she is on there, but it can't be, you know, Tim, the subway operator. Got it. Okay. Makes sense. What if, um, so going back to kind of our list of questions, what if the policyholder is not in the right frame of mind and changes the beneficiary? They're drunk, they were on meds, whatever the case may be. Changes the beneficiary yeah. when they're out of mind. Correct. Yeah, so the change of the beneficiary, although simple, is not necessarily quick. So it's not something that you could just come online and click a few things when you're wasted one night and, and it happens, right? You're gonna have to go through your agent. Now, mm. your agent, me, is a fiduciary. So I have a legal obligation to make sure that you are of sound mind to do this uh, and if i okay. miss that step or your agent misses that step that is liable to not be held to not hold up got it makes sense yeah. okay yeah. so if you hear my wife calling you to change it she's probably not in the right frame of mind she's probably hammered yeah Good probably yeah Good just let's know. just throw that out there now and, okay you know, Noted. recorded yeah mm -hmm. sweet yeah um <laughs> And I know you already kind of addressed this, but yeah, there are no beneficiaries because they passed away. It just, the money just disappears. Like, More or just... less. Yeah. And I cannot drive this point home enough. If there is not a beneficiary listed yeah, um, or, you know, it got like, let's just think of an awful scenario where you've, let's say you've got you know, multiple primaries listed. So, you know, like I've got a family, they have six kids and a spouse and she and he, they both listed six beneficiaries, mm -hmm. uh, seven beneficiaries each, right? The money's just gonna get split seven ways. Right. Um, if heaven forbid they got in some horrible accident and everybody died sure. and there was no contingent beneficiaries listed, yeah, where would it go? There, probably back into the insurance company. There's yeah. there's nowhere for it to go. You can't have somebody come forward and be like, well, I think that was meant for me. It doesn't yeah, work right. like that, right? Yeah. Now, if you had seven primaries listed and no contingents listed and one or two of those people passed away uh, at the time that the uh, insured passed away, it would just get split amongst the remaining five. Which would make sense. So I wonder, would it be an interesting idea to put charities down? as like the third or fourth beneficiary. So it's like, okay, no matter what happens, God forbid something would happen to all the beneficiaries, like the charity is gonna be around. So at least they get some sort of benefit from it. Yeah, and that's, I love that you brought that up. You could do that. Um, the Probably the cleanest way to do that would be through a trust. So you would uh, want okay. to establish that trust and trusts, they, you know, I have learned a lot about trust in the last few years, just being in life insurance. Um, it, they go hand in hand. I work with a lot of trust attorneys. Um, they would be, um, that's the cleanest way to do something like that, to give to a charity, because you could just designate within the confines of the trust itself where this money is going to go. Um, and then if not, you would just really have to have you know, it's all about the story, about really about the story that we put into play, like how and why, why would I choose, you know, the ASPCA to get right. all my or something, right? Got it. Okay. That makes sense. So let's, um, so let's kind of switch gears and talk about insurance agents like yourself. How, yes. What should, because, you know, it's just like in real estate, right? You could have different loan officers for the same mortgage company. They all perform differently. On the real estate side, you could be, there could be a hundred realtors under the same company. Each one performs differently. Sure. So I would imagine it's somewhat similar in your world as well. So how can yeah. someone kind of navigate through that? How do they know they, they talk to someone and be like, yeah, you're not the right person for me. Yeah, it's a really, <laughs> I mean, super valid question. You know, 
when choosing an agent, there's a couple of things that I personally would advise you to look for. Number one, I think when you choose an independent agent is ideal. Um, the independent reason, meaning you can go to different insur life insurance companies yes. rather than just going straight to John Hancock or something like that. Exactly. So if you, um, I know there will be an opportunity, but on my Instagram page, I just posted a video yesterday about what independence means as an insurance agent. Mm -hmm. And it's a great way to familiarize yourself with the difference between an independent agent and a captive agent. So a captive agent is somebody who works for somebody like New York Life, Primerica, uh, Northwestern Mutual, okay? Mm -hmm. And they can sell those products. Um, an independent agent like myself, I really work for the client as opposed to mm. a company. And I go and get myself contracted on an individual basis. I don't work for anybody but me. Um, mm. That's not all independent agents, but in my case it is. Um, and then we just go get contracted and then find the best product for the best or for our client, right? Um, now, if you do all of your other insurances, let's say through farmers insurance, and you want to keep everything umbrellaed under them, and you don't have a lot of health implications. So what happens at a captive agency, their bars and their thresholds are pretty low. Okay, so if you've got, you know, high cholesterol, or perhaps you're a smoker, or you had some sort of angioplasty some years ago, the bars are low and you're going to just kind of be disqualified pretty quickly with a lot of those companies, the captive mm -hmm. companies. Whereas with an independent agent, there's options, right? Because we, we are affiliated and appointed with so many different carriers. But back to what I was saying, if you have like your homeowners and your car and your earthquake and your umbrella under farmers, and you don't have, you know, really any health implications to be concerned about, go get your life insurance through them. Keep it all in one house. I think that's a great plan by all means, right? Mm -hmm. But if you want options um, and you maybe want to know like what the range in price could be, or, you know, we've talked about a few different scenarios today. Like what if I wanted to do this? Some people want to know like what a tiered approach option would be. That's when you would really want to go to um, an independent agent. And I, overall would recommend an independent agent because it just opens up your options sure. and you can keep the price pretty low by doing that. Um, as far as choosing the right agent, once you've gotten to that point, you know, I think just like with realtors, you would want to consider interviewing. It's really, you want to connect with the person. Mm -hmm. um, some things to look out for that you would want to steer clear of is somebody who's a fast talker, maybe somebody who's using jargon that you really are not familiar with, <clears throat> excuse me, and they're not taking the time to explain it. Um, one of the services that I offer is a complimentary policy review. Um, I cannot tell you how often I do this for somebody. Um, and it's really an opportunity for me to familiarize myself with them as it is for them to familiarize their, themselves with me. And I go and I review their policies. They have no idea what they're paying for. No clue. Huh. Often they, more often than not, they are way overpaying for something that they don't need to be paying for. It's awful. It drives me crazy. Um, I think the industry has gotten a bad rap because of, because of this kind of stuff. Sure. Um, so you shouldn't be overpaying. You should understand exactly, you know, one thing I always tell it's a Zig Ziglar quote, like I told you, I'm kind of a nerd, but you know, the goal when I'm talking to my clients is I want you to understand this life insurance policy or plan as well as you understand this blank sheet of paper right here. There should be no question what's inside of this policy. So if you start working with an agent who's talking so Hang on, I think I lost you. Saw it. Oh, there yeah. you are. There you go. Let's yeah. go back to you talking about um, being fast talkers. Yeah, right. So if you're talking to an agent who is a fast talker, they're using jargon that you're not familiar with and they're not slowing down to check in with you. Does that make sense? Do you have questions for me? If they seem 
irritated, you know, I'm a person who reads energy very well. And if this person seems irritated at my umpteen thousand questions, mm -hmm. we are not a good fit. Right. No, it's, it's true. Cause I've seen people where well, they'll use, you know, like you said, like the jargon, big words, and they're trying to do it to make themselves, I think, sound smarter than the person. So it's like, oh, you should trust me because I know all this lingo. Mm -hmm. But yes. I think people are kind of seeing past that, right? Like people used to do like the word of the day, like calendars. And so yeah. I was like, yeah, I should learn a new word every day. I'm like, why? If nobody else knows what word I'm saying, what's the point? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> like, right? It's like, what's the value of it? You can just make up a word for that matter, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, it confuses people. And it also, I think, scares them. I know on the real estate side, that happens all the time. Yes. Yes. And I mean, this, you know, not just on the physical agent side, but also like there's all sorts of companies like Policy Genius and I can't think of another company right now, but there's all sorts of life insurance companies advertising on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook and all of these mediums that we see every day. And it makes it seem very easy for the consumer. All I have to go in and do is enter my birthday, you know, my height and weight. And just like that, I'm going to have a life insurance policy. That's fine if you want to be a number, if you don't mm -hmm. want to have a conversation. And, and it works for some people. Sure. But... I talk to these, I talk to people who start that process daily and they're like, I just got so confused or I got on the phone with an agent because there's always an agent that you can talk to. And he just started saying things that I just didn't understand. And I feel like I was expected to understand and da, da, da. And it's like, that really takes the personality and the, the personableness out of the story. And when you're talking real estate, loan, insurance, car purchase, yeah. anything that's an investment really should be handled by a human whom you can trust. I talk to all of my clients, all of my past, present, and future clients on my cell phone, yeah. my everyday cell phone that my mother calls me on because, mm -hmm. and I let them know this is my cell phone and you may text me and you may call me and I'm knocking on wood. I may regret that one day, <laughs> but it works so far because I want to be a resource. And if you're talking to an agent, that's hard to get a hold of that, you know, this is like one of the best worst examples I could ever tell you. I did a complimentary policy review for a young couple, uh, early thirties, super financially savvy and they each husband and wife were paying $150 a month for a uh, disability insurance. Hmm. Now that's fine. I'm glad that these people like took the time to consider disability insurance. However, he is not a foreman and she is not a foreman. They both sit at a desk all day to work, right? Like, right. like I do. In order for them to take advantage of that disability policy, they would have to break both hands and or go blind. I mean, the screens what? are getting kind of intense right now. What? The screens are getting kind of intense right now. Well, that is true. Right. <laughs> I mean, they are very bright. <laughs> but, but like, what is the probability yeah. of that happening? Right. Right? Like disability insurance is a great thing to have if you need it. Sure. If you may fall off of a wire, right? Or fall out of, you know, if you're an arborist and you might fall out of a tree and you can't work, you need disability insurance. And I can help with that too, right? Right. But if you are sitting at a desk all day and you're a video editor or a software engineer, you don't need it. Yeah. I mean... And I think you bring up an interesting point just in this, in the sense of like, just how sales are going, right? Cause everyone thinks a lot of agents, realtors, whatever they're, they're going to be phased out because of the internet, because all this stuff's automated. But to your point, it's like, they're not checking if you actually need disability or not. Right. Right. They're not, they're not having those questions or there's no one really looking out for them because like you said, you're just a number. So you go through this process, they're going to collect your money. Cause they're like, whatever, you're willing to pay it. I mean, yeah. I know on the, on the mortgage side, you know, I've had clients when they're about to buy a property and they're like, there's all these mortgage documents. Like mine, when we, when my wife and I bought our house, it was about a hundred pages because we had all these extra writers. Sure. And so she's like, have you been reading this? I'm like, we don't have a choice. 
right? Yeah. It's like you just sign it because yes, you want to look for certain things, but it's like, what are you gonna do? Yeah. yeah. What what I know. I think that too. Like even when you're as trivial as it is, you know, when you're downloading an app. Oh, right. Hundred percent. Terms of use. Yeah, like, what is sure. this? I'm gonna sit here with my fine tooth comb and and read your, you know, whatever it's called. Yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna check the box because yeah. I want the app. Like what's exactly, my alternative? Right. I'm not like, getting it. Like, enough people. No. Have been, I'm, what I'm hoping is that they've been sued enough times to have it done right. That's right. right? Like someone <laughs> yeah. else has reviewed yeah. it. We, and there is like you bring up a great point there because there is an element of trust that goes yeah. into all of this. You know, we you know to kind of play it back on COVID. You know, we recently had this situation where somebody didn't want to see us because she thought we were like this really great risk, right? And I'm like, look, and at some point, and we're very careful people, but sure. at some point, when you walk out of your house, you are taking in risk. So whether you go to the grocery store once a month, or you are in the workforce every single day, you're taking on risk. Now we hope it's calculated mm -hmm. and we hope that it's not something that you're just, you know, throwing caution to the wind with. But when it comes to sales, at some rate, you are taking a risk right. because you're putting your trust into somebody and you hope that that person is worthy of your trust. And we always have that intuition, sure. that feeling inside of our being, right? That says, this is a good person. I feel good here. And if you don't, you got to trust it. You yeah. really do. Oh, it's yeah. so critical. For sure. I had, we were working with a contractor. I was like, something just doesn't feel right. And people like, no, no, give it a shot, give it a shot. So I had him start doing some work. I'm like, doesn't feel right. And then all of a sudden I was right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes yeah. those gut feelings, they're, they're true, right? It's and so it's, true. It's like with, um, it's really coming with car salesmen. Like I yeah. hate buying a car or leasing <laughs> a car. I just, you gotta take me with you. I make them cry. Oh no, I've gotten it down to about 15 minutes. Yeah, right? Like I go in and say, this is what I want. If you can make it happen, then I just won't go anywhere. Like, let's just get it done. And I'm, and I'm always realistic. Like, I'm not like, hey, I want a hundred bucks a month for like, you know, a Hummer or whatever. Yes, no, it's like, I'm the same way. Yeah, it's like, yes. this is what I want. I know it's within range. Get me there and we're done. Or we don't have a deal. Yeah, I'll just, I'll walk out. I don't have time. Yeah. Like I've seen people negotiate three, four hours. Like they, they live off of it. I'm like- I love to negotiate, but like, no, not for my car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so true. And you know, you, you like loathe cars, car salesmen. And I know everybody has to have their job and that's how we've got all these cars. Right. And I've had a few salesmen. good experiences, like two, but like, so they, they exist. They exist. But I'm not more, knocking all of them. Well, that's how I feel about life insurance agents. Yeah. to be really frank. And I feel, and it's, you know, it's something that when I start this process with anybody um, and I encourage anybody listening or, you know, now, or when I speak with clients or prospects on the phone, once upon a time in person, <laughs> let's just talk without their feeling like there's an obligation. And I actually mean that I'm right. not like, let's just talk and let me get out my wallet so I can start spending the money you're going to give me. I really mean, let's just talk and see because I don't care if you get it from me or from Rick. I just want to make sure that whatever you do get, it comes from an educated place. Or if you right. choose not to get it, it comes from an educated place. But I'll tell you what, I have to more often than not smash the misconceptions of life insurance agents hmm. because the industry, um, and I'm sure it, it, this goes for most industries with sales involved, but certainly mine. People have been taken advantage of by so many flipping agents mm -hmm. that before we can even get into the nitty gritty, which is life planning and um, making sure your assets are covered and your loved ones are protected, I have to get through all of that. And not in a bad way. I'm very happy to do that, but it is so frustrating. Like the couple I just exemplified, that was not an online sale. That was an agent from a company. Um, who, uh, who was a life insurance agent. And you know what he did? He upsold them. That's what mm -hmm. he did. So it was a $300 addition to their bottom line. It's 3,600 bucks a year. That's ridiculous for something they never, ever needed. Right. And that's, I run into that 
all the time. They're, they're up sales. So yeah. when I quote people life insurance, more often than not, they're like, that's it. Like, they're <laughs> so pleasantly surprised. And I say like, well, what have you been looking at? What, ha what quotes have you been getting? Oh, at least double that. Yeah. I'm like, well, do you want me to make a double? Because I can. For sure. <laughs> you know, yeah. If you really want to spend more, we can work that out. Yeah. But I'm really in the business of making sure that people protect themselves. And the fact that I get paid is great. Yeah. But I'm not trying to get rich off of any person. Right. And that's also how you get referrals and how you get repeat yes. customers, the whole nine yards. Yes, right. that is how I believe how I've been successful at my business in such for a short sure. time. Definitely yeah. seems like it. <laughs> so, Thanks. Well, yeah. Um, okay, so the last and one of the most important questions, if someone is interested in getting life insurance or wants to have the conversation, how do they yeah. get a hold of you? Yeah, it is a very important question. Uh, so I mentioned my Instagram page earlier. Um, mm -hmm. That is living underscore W underscore M, uh, E-M, because I'm Emily. Um, and then my email address is Emily at living with M or with them, as some people think it is, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> dot com. And um, I mean, am I a lame if I give you my cell phone number? Or you want to? Either way, go for it. Because I mean, I'm going to put really it in the show notes. This is my BFF, my my little baby. Um, you won't, we won't tell it to your kids or your husband. <laughs> tell nobody. Just tell no one. <laughs> Um, my cell phone, I am always available, 818-216-1170. Um, I really would ask just, if you're not sure if this is for you or not for you, um, let's just have a conversation, ask me some questions, pick my brain, rapid fire some questions, lightning round yeah. <laughs> scenarios at me. Um, you know, I think it's, like I said, it's better to be educated and decide against it than to just decide against it. Makes sense. Yeah. Very cool. Oh, and my, did I, yeah, I gave you all the, I gave you all the good info. Yeah. All so. the good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Oh, and my website, livingwithm.com. Yeah. Done. A good one. That is a good one. I like yes. that one. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, was there anything else we should know? Anything else that people should know before we kind of sign off? No, but this was lovely. I'm really grateful for the time and the attention. Um, <laughs> and um, it's just been really nice chatting with you, Rick. You know, I, uh, I really admire what you're doing on the, on the interwebs. You're doing a really great job. Thank you. So thanks Appreciate for uh, helping spread the good word of, of local business. And yeah. yeah, best of luck to you. Thank you. All good right. Luck. Well, this is Rick Albert. Thank you so much, Emily, once again. And uh, you have an amazing weekend. It's Friday.